what if we pitched an idea to Steve Aoki, we're both very creative, we'll hire the team. And so he went and pitched the idea and Steve Aoki freaking loved it. And Steve Aoki had a storyline that he's always wanted to do. So we collaborated ah. and, um, and that's really, and that's where we book. came out with um, Neon Future. Stand by. Three, two, one. The following program comes from executive producer Lillian Garcia. Every athlete is on this quest. Every performer dives in head first, battling real life challenges and overcoming obstacles in an effort to make their dreams reality. reality. Singer, speaker, and 15 year WWE host Lillian Garcia was the first woman to ever announce WrestleMania and is now the PFL MMA cage announcer. Oh, yeah. And now she's giving you an all access pass to the human interest stories of elite athletes, extraordinary entertainers, and wellness experts. Now let's embark on another fascinating journey of chasing glory with your host, Lillian Garcia. Welcome everybody, Chasing Glory. That's right, another episode here where we listen to people's stories and their chase for glory and we learn so much from them. Thank you so much for following us at Chasing Glory on Instagram. Really appreciate that. And remember that you can listen to the show wherever you get your podcast or you can watch us. That's right, we're in studio. Watch us youtube.com slash Lillian Garcia. For all things Chasing Glory, just go to chasingglory.com. My guest today as we continue to celebrate Women's History Month is someone who is such a badass. Oh my gosh, Lisa Bilyeu. Love her. I've gotten to know Lisa for about over a year now. So excited because uh, she came on my radar and when I saw what this woman has done, her and her husband, they both you know, kicked off and did Quest Bars, that little bar that's so good and so yummy that just recently sold for like a billion dollars, yet they were mortgaging their house in order to do it. She will talk about that and the story about that and why and how they made that successful and how now they're doing Impact Theory and Women of Impact, these two shows that really are impacting the world. But their love of comic books. That's right, they've done a lot of different comic books even one with Steve Aoki. So freaking cool. You guys have got to check this out. And I even wore my little uh, Sailor Moon shirt just now as a little thank you to her. It's funny because in the interview with her, I had like a comic book character shirt that I had gotten in Barcelona when I was there. I remember saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to interview Lisa. I want to get the shirt. But then I ended up giving her this shirt because I know she loves comic books so bad that uh, I went ahead and give that, gave that shirt literally off my back. But now I wanted to go ahead and put the Sailor Moon because it is still fun. It is all about what she is. She's just fun. They love Japan, love this whole comic book life. And I just can't wait to uh, bring this story to you. So what do you say? Let's do it. Here we go. Here is Lisa Bilyeu's journey of chasing glory. Growing up in a traditional Greek Orthodox family, British-born Lisa Bilyeu never settled even at a young age. She would be extremely passionate for all things art and creativity and set her mind on getting a filmmaking degree. After studying for a few years in London, she convinced her father to let her borrow $10,000 to study film all the way in Los Angeles. Lucky for her, fate would play a big role in her life when her film school teacher ended up being her future husband. For nearly a decade, Lisa became the supporting housewife that she thought she needed to be. She wasn't unhappy, but she also wasn't satisfied with the life that she was living. Along with her husband, Tom, who wasn't happy with the results he and his business partners were receiving, they would begin making protein bars by hand as they wanted to show everyone that healthy food could still taste great. That would lead to the formation of Quest Nutrition, which although was met with initial criticism, would rise to number two on the Inc. 500 fastest growing private companies. The endless nights of packing boxes in her living room would pay off when Quest Nutrition would grow 57,000% each year. And just last year, in 2019, Quest Nutrition would be sold for one billion dollars. With the success of Quest, Lisa and Tom used their money to make an impact in the world 
and would launch Impact Theory, where she is the co-founder and president. It's an endeavor that has the mission to leverage the self-sustaining power of commerce to radically influence global culture. The couple would build a studio and launch a TV show that would help people for years to come and also fulfill her initial love of creativity and production. Impact Theory continues to give people an empowering mindset by creating best-in-class entertainment and educational content that has surpassed over 100 million views. Lisa then decided to step in front of the camera as well and build her own show, Women of Impact, which continues to motivate and get women to recognize that they can become the heroes in their own lives. If that wasn't enough, with a love of comic books and drawing, Lisa and her husband continue to venture into the world of comic books and graphic novels. Get fired up as it's about to get real, raw, and inspiring with Lisa Bilyeu. So it's about to get real, raw, inspiring, and exciting with Lisa Billion. <laughs> How can I be announced by anyone more perfect than you, girl? Oh, you're amazing. (laughs) You're amazing. You know what? I usually say real, raw, inspiring and don't say exciting, but it just made me want to say exciting because you are an exciting person. (laughs) You're just this little bundle of joy that I've gotten so happy to, to get to know more, to hang out with. And, you know... I want to start this by letting my audience know how we even met, yeah. how this came to fruition. Um, my whole idea of bringing you here, and I was on your show, which was awesome. Um, and then them getting to know your comic book side, which is, I can't wait to hear all about this. <laughs> I'm so excited. But even with your company, Quest, um, people know about your bars. Yeah, you guys, this little bar right here, there's a whole story behind this. <laughs> Unbelievable. Thank you. But I want to say, I want to thank you because the way that I got to know you, obviously I knew of you and I knew Tom. And I had seen Tom at Powerful You at the stage yeah. and been like blown away by him and all. And, um, and then Chris McDonald, through a friend of ours, who books your talent, our friend of ours hooked us up. We went out to dinner with him and Chris. And then from there, he was like, you would be perfect to meet Lisa and be part of Women of Impact, the dinners that they have. And I will not lie to you. When when he first suggested it, I was like, oh, a room full of women um, that I don't know for this dinner? because of my experience with women and you and I have had this conversation mm-hmm. at dinner but I want to you know elaborate on it here and get to know a little bit more on your side but the fact that women I'd been bullied by women um, early on when I moved from Spain and so my trust with women was a little bit very guarded and protective and just not not good not good experience so the thought of have walking into a room full of women at your event i was like oh oh my god but i knew i wanted to meet you so i was like all right Uh we're doing this because i want to meet lisa so i walk in (laughs) and you're not down there yet and i meet some women but at first it's like it's super freaking awkward and uncomfortable i know but as the night progressed it was lovely and what was best about it was the fact that we formed a bigger bond from that Mm -hmm. and then you know we've gone on dinners after that you know with eve torres and my audience knows eve torres very well from wwe and of course roxy which was her friend and just i'm glad that i put myself in that uncomfortable environment Mm -hmm. to then get this out of it for sure i want to start people by first of all like asking you because I know that early on you as well had an experience of Mm. being bullied but what's your definition of being bullied well for me it wasn't like I was never locked in a you know a closet and you know beaten yeah I wasn't Um, either but I was definitely emotionally bullied so um you know teased for my nose I was called concord um oh wow yeah um I'm Greek so I had a very long name and so it was it's Haralambos and so kids you know kids can be cruel yeah. Right, and so it became Shag a lamppost, and now oh, I find it hilarious now, now, right? Where it was like, but at the time, but at the time, it was heartbreaking, and 
that sort of thing just adds another chip to like my low, my, had added a chip to my low self-esteem. So I was brought up, my brother is very um, naturally intelligent. So when it came to math, he was amazing at it. So was my sister, my family coming from a very traditional Greek family valued um, that intellect over the artistic side. And I don't mm-hmm. blame them. It's just their culture and the way they were brought up because that equaled a job. Right back then, it was like an artist doesn't equal a job. It equals being poor and struggling for the rest of your life. That's how my father saw it. So I was brought up in that type of atmosphere. So my brother was really smart. He was very good looking. My sister was very smart. She was very good looking. And here I was getting teased at school. I had the unibrow. I had the frizzy hair. I actually had one of those braces, the head braces that went around. Like everything you could possibly imagine. I, I had had those. And so... So I, yes, I was teased, I was called names, um, and it really did affect my my self esteem growing up. And I definitely thought, um, you know, I wasn't good enough. And just like you, when you're like, even as an adult growing up, or as, as adults as us, it's we're still fearful of walking into a, um, a place and not being accepted. Yeah. Right. And so it's the, like I'm I'm 15 or or 100%. 10 all over again. It's like, yeah. Oh God. And I realized that it was holding me back because I was realizing that I wasn't socializing as an adult because I was always fearful that I was gonna get judged. And for me, the only way I could overcome that is push myself and lean into it and make myself so uncomfortable that I have to get over it. Mm. And so holding dinners, everyone thinks I'm super social and I have this massive group of female friends. I really don't. I ended up starting the show, meeting incredible women and just started inviting people. And I kind of said to myself, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, the worst that can happen is it ends up being a disaster. Either no one turns up or these women make fun of me, right? Which is very potential or I get judged and then That's the worst that can happen. And so I just told myself, if that can happen and I can pick myself up again and get over it, why not try it? Mm. And so in trying it, the most incredible thing that happened was realizing almost every woman felt the same. Oh yeah. Hearing your story. You're not the first person that's told me that. Really? Many women who've come to the dinners have said to me, Lisa, when I first came, I didn't know anyone. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if I should come and I wasn't sure what type of group of people. And so I said to myself when starting the dinners was, what are the things that are authentic to me? What are the things that reflect who I am? Because if it doesn't work out, at least I was true to me. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I'm not this dress up. I mean, I love dressing up, but like if I'm having a dinner with some friends, I want to be in my sweats. I want to be super comfy. I want to giggle. And so that's why we try to do like sweatpants soiree or, you know, the pajama party. Yeah, that was amazing. And it also lets women's guards down, right? right? Because it's not about what are you wearing? How do you look? How does your hair look? Which a lot of people worry about. And so I kind of just tried to shed all of that from the start. Yeah, that was the thing when when I got that. I think the very first one that I went to was Mm. the Christmas one, which by the way, the way (laughs) you guys decorate for Christmas, I loved it. Oh my God. This was Go big or go home, baby. Go big or go home. (laughs) I can't believe it's already been over a year. That's crazy because it was uh, 2018, the Christmas one. Wow. But I remember walking in and we were all had Christmas pajamas and I was like, this is pretty cool that I could come to a party like that. So that I totally agree. And like I said, I'm, I'm glad I put myself in that environment. And I was the mm-hmm. same thing. Right? I was like, OK, Lil, you got to do this. Like you just got to break out of the shell and get past it. And so I encourage people out there that are maybe in the same situation. Mm-hmm. Just put yourself in those uncomfortable situations and you will survive. Above all, you will survive. And that's the thing is really ask yourself, what is the worst that can happen? Like that that legitimately changed my entire life. Because when I started to go, okay, ignore the fear because it's scary, you get anxiety, maybe your heart starts like racing. But really, what is actually the worst that can happen? Mm -hmm. And so when it's like it's a birthday party or a, a party or a dinner or something that ends up no one comes or it's a disaster, no one has fun all right, well, at least I know, right? At least now I can not lie on my deathbed and say, what if I'd had that party? Would that have made a difference to my social life or would I have met incredible people? And so that really does allow me to go, all right, Lisa, now it's just the fear talking. The worst that can happen, you can live through it. 
But I do fear about people not coming. I actually yeah. held a party one time for girls because my husband was like trying to encourage me to have that, right? Yeah. So I, I was like, okay. It was literally like Tuesday and inviting people for Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I was pushing. Where's this bad planning go? Bad planning. <laughs> but I was like, "All right, just do it, just do it." And he was asking me weeks, "Are you going to do this? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do this?" And then fine, I just had such anxiety. And then finally Tuesday, I was like, "All right, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to put it out there." I was like, "All right, guys, I'm going to have this little. It was just a happy hour." I was like, "I'm going to have a happy hour at the house on Friday. You guys are more, than, you know, welcome, invited." And I got all this stuff and anxiety, anxiety. Yeah. I was like, "Is anybody going to come? Is anybody going to come?" Not only did everybody come. But more than people that were invited, they, they started amazing. inviting other people, right? So they all came and had a great time. Like they stayed the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I looked around, I was like, whoa, but you know what I ended up doing? I started going, wait, are they really here for me? Or is it because I'm with been with the WWE? Mm -hmm. And I, I was that little girl in middle school going, do you really like me for me? Or, you know, so does that ever come in your mind going, are they yeah. here for me? Or is it because of I'm doing Women of Impact? Or Yeah, it is, but I try to reframe it because it can be, that can, that kind of thinking can be quite destructive, right? Absolutely. And so, but what if you think about it from, but part of you is WWE, right? Like, yes, that, that may be why they are here, but that's part of who you are. So when I say to myself, okay, are they coming because of what I've built? Are they coming because of the financial success that I've had at Quest? Are they coming because, you know, of our, our social platform and our YouTube? It's like, of course, they're going to be people and to... To not think that is naive of me, so I'm very aware of that. And then I also just tell myself, Lisa, trust your gut. You, right, and things come out in the wash. So it's like, I may not realize from day one when I first meet someone, if they have an ulterior motive or not. I may not realize from day two, but eventually it's gonna come out, it'll come out in the wash, and you'll see. And so I've learned to not waste time and energy panicking about that, mm -hmm. that's number one. And then B, say, okay, well, even if someone is here maybe because of Quest, but I freaking built Quest, and Quest is a part of me. Yeah. And so to say they're here just for that, it's like, no, no, that's a part of me. And to negate that and say that that's something separate is almost, I think, a disservice to myself, right? right? And so even think about people coming for your birthday. Are they coming because I used to work at WWE? But that has been a part of you. And so Lillian Garcia does Chasing Glory, but also has a history at WWE. That's what makes you great. And to say that, that shouldn't be a part of the reason is almost dismissive of what this. you've accomplished. I love this. The perspective is everything, it and is. I welcome you. I mean, I really <laughs> thank you for that because it's like I needed that. I needed just to know and to you know reframe it. All right, so this leads me to Quest okay. because that was a big thing for you. Yeah. But you first wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be the first filmmaker to win, win an award. F first female to win an award in directing. In directing. Sadly, yeah. Catherine Bigelow has been me too. Yeah. Yes, that was my dream. <laughs> she deserved, deserved it, it for I know, sure. I like, man, how can you hide it. The, the chick did an amazing yeah. freaking job. But because of, I mean, because I know you ended up going to film school. Yes. Right, and that's where you met Tom. So I went to film school in England, I studied yeah. at university, and I didn't feel like I'd had enough practical experience. I learned how to use cameras, how to work mics, things like that, and I was like, I have no idea how to direct. I don't know how to do character development. I don't know how to create a mood with music and camera angles, and so I was like, okay, I don't feel like I actually got what I needed from college. And my friend handed me this brochure and it was called the New York Film Academy. And it was an eight week course. I could come to Los Angeles, film on the back lots at Universal Studios. So I managed to persuade my dad to give me the money to do it. I walk in, day one, my teacher is my husband, or who's now become my husband, right, Tom. Right, right. So. Um, how was that for you to have, like, eventually, like, you guys were just hanging out? and <laughs> It was weird because he ignored me for, like, the first six weeks. And... Like, did you like him run off? Well, it was even more so because he was ignoring me, if I'm ah! going to be honest. Like, <laughs> I, so I walk in, I'm like, oh, he's hot. And then he completely ignored me. And then afterwards, we the truth came out that he had been very bad with women. He was the guy that was super romantic. He would go on dates and on the dirt face date, he would buy flowers and he would write poems for them. And he would realize, he's like, why am I not getting laid? And he um. would turn to like his friends 
Um, and there was one guy who was just getting women left, right and center. It's like, what is your trick? And he's like, dude, just don't pay them too much attention. Mm. Now, a young guy in his 20s hears that. He's like, let me give it a shot. I was his first candidate. <laughs> I'm like, babe, you didn't do very good because we ended up getting married. So. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but I was his first person that he tried it on and it freaking worked. And so for six weeks, he was purely just like, teacher mode i'm very attracted to creative people so he's very creative and so the more he ignored me the more interested i was and then he asked me on the first date but i was still at the school so it was very hush hush right i was wondering if he was a little yeah. bit shy about that going oh i'm about to ask my student right and yeah. so we kind of kept it a little hush hush and so he's thinking He'd been in this relationship, this one girl, and she got a little clingy. So he was like, all right, well, at least legally she has to leave the country because her visa will run out. Ah. So even if she falls for me, it doesn't matter, she has to leave. I'm thinking this is a great story to tell. Like, I'm thinking when I'm 90 years old and I'm a grandmother, I can tell my grandkids, <laughs> granny was once hot and ah. like had, you know, had this like fun summer fling with this hot American guy. Right. And so I'm going in there with no preconceived notions. He's going in there with no preconceived notions. And so that first date was so electric because I'd never met a guy who was not BSing me. Mm -hmm. He wasn't trying to like, get the girl for you know like time and time again he's just like this is me and yeah. it is what it is yeah and so i'm like yeah well it's not going to be a relationship so i don't have to pretend to be you know pretend right, on the right, first right. date which in my 20s i definitely did um and so on that first day i was like this is a guy I've, I've never met a guy like this before like it's so refreshing he's so honest like i can't believe some of the things he's telling me that's yeah. so honest that I was, it was so refreshing. So anyway, that ended up, that was 19 years ago. Yeah. So do you recommend that for men now? To yeah, be I mean, I that? think, I, I definitely think so. And for women, because even looking back now, it's like, if, you, if you're trying to find somebody who is going to be a long-term fit, set them up for success. Mm -hmm. Be so you that on date two, date three, date four, they know you already. There's right. no hiding it. Right. And that's ultimately like, if you're looking for someone long term, right? Yeah. That's the best advice I can give because you want to be you. So why not show it from the get go instead of trying over time to slowly, you know, well, all right, I'm a really, I'm messy, right? And I've pretended up to this point, I'm really neat. That messiness, let me tell you, three, four years down the line can actually break up your relationship. Yeah, yeah, true. So it's just be, be, be honest. Be real, be very respectful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's definitely what I would advise. I, I think you're right because I, re I recall even my first, you know, interaction with my husband now, it was a real, it was real mm -hmm. from the get go. He was real. We had real conversation. It was like, wow, this is incredible the way. So I, I totally recommend that as well. Because you might imagine you're you, yeah. completely you, and your husband, you know, you go on your first date and he's like, yeah, no, I, I don't dig this about her now. Wouldn't you rather know then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? It's oh, like yeah. you want someone to love you as you. you. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm ever perfect. I always want to change and grow. And Tom and I encourage and push each other to improve. So I'm not saying be you and that's that. But the core foundation of who you are, mm -hmm. be honest. Because then if someone's attracted to that, that's beautiful. Yeah, and that's why I always say, I always end the saying, remember to always be yourself and trust that it's enough. Because yeah. people are out there creating these personas mm -hmm. and that only lasts a little while. And then the real you comes out and that person goes, well, wait, where's that other person? Why? Well, that other person wasn't really me. I was trying to just get you. Yeah. Well, why would you want to get somebody with a person that you really are not? Mm -hmm. Because it will come out that's and then so... it's just, oh, mayhem. Yeah. Okay, but let me talk then about quest as I was always saying oh, yeah. because that was a big part of your story from the filmmaking and all of that you guys end up being married then you end up being housewife for eight years yeah. um and you thought okay Greek being Greek part of you was like this is what's okay it's acceptable it's fine but you started then little by little going this is not so fine. Yeah, it's it's interesting because there was two parts of me. Now in reflection, it's easy to see. There were two parts of me. I'm a dreamer. I always have been. So I've always had, I want to do this, I want to do that. And as a kid, I was gung-ho. I'm going to do it. You know, oh, I'm going to pick up and go to America for eight weeks. I knew, didn't know anyone, but like, oh, it's a dream. 
And then I had this part of me, the foundation part of me that is very um, um, rooted in my culture, in the Greek, um, you know, the way that it's like, be a wife, have children. I wanted to be a wife. I wanted to have children. And that's the thing. I wanted this amazing career and I wanted to be an amazing wife and have kids. But I never really said to myself, how do you actually do that? And if something took priority, which one would you choose? Like, I never put things like that in my head. So go to film school, meet Tom, we get married, we move to America, I get my first job on a movie set and I hate it. Oh, you hate it? I hate it. Because people were literally and metaphorically stepping on me. So I was hired as a set photographer. I was like, oh my God, this is my dream come true. I'm in Hollywood, I'm on a, working on a movie, there's some famous actors on here. It was still low budget, but there were still some famous actors. I've got a photography gig, so it, like I'm doing something creative. Yeah. And the DP would just yell at me. I literally got stepped on. Um, there was one time where one of the actors threw something at me, oh, and wow. I was like, my entire life, my entire dreams have to be in Hollywood on a movie set, and here I am. Miserable. And I'm miserable. And I said, I refuse to stick to a dream that isn't actually satisfying. Like when the reality comes, is it actually serving you? And I was like, I never want to just dig my heels in and be like, well, I said I was going to be in movies, so here I am. I was like, this isn't an industry I want to be a part of. Mm. I am not willing to let people step on me to get ahead. I'm just too feisty for that. And I'm not willing to step on someone else. I have morals and I have codes. That's amazing. And... I have that fine line, I know what that fine line is, and if someone's asking me to cross it, I just won't do it. And so I wasn't willing to step on people. And so I was heartbroken, but I had to face reality. And Tom had had a similar experience where he wrote a script, and someone took it, and they totally butchered it, and he didn't want his name Uh. on it. And so we looked at each other, and we sat down and had that hard conversation. It's like, all our lives we've been set, we met, we're gonna make movies, and here we are, and we both hate it. So at the time, Tom was like, well, why don't we just make our own money and we'll finance it ourselves? Yeah. Like, sure, that sounds like a great idea. And yeah. I'm 22, you know, he's young, you're naive. And he's like, well, let's just, I'll go out and work in business and I'll start my own company. And so the, the goal was, okay, he's going to go out and start his own company. And how do I partner up with him to do that? So right. we looked at all the successful people that had really crushed it. And we looked at Steve Jobs and we're like, okay, how does he, he live his life? And you look at Steve Jobs and he always wore the same Same color, right? It never changed. It was always like a black t-shirt or Mm -hmm. a black polo. And when he's asked why, he says, because you can only make a certain amount of decisions in a day with clarity. And he didn't want any waste of a decision on a clothes, on food or anything like that. So we're like, all right, well, how do we rope that into our lives? It mm-hmm. Clearly it worked for him. So we had decided he's going to go out to work and I'm going to carry all other decisions every decision that needs to be made. So he wakes up, his gym clothes are literally by his bed. He puts his gym clothes on, he goes to the gym, he comes back, his work clothes are laid out for him. His lunch is already there. So he doesn't have to think about anything. You were doing all that. And I was doing all that. And as a partnership, we had agreed, we're gonna do this for maybe a year, maybe 18 months. I can do that, I have a mission, I have a purpose, I can really lock onto that. And he did, and so we went down that path. That year turned into eight years of chasing money. And that left us both emotionally bankrupt. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy because people think money is everything. No, it was, so that's when he said, I can't do this anymore. And I said, babe, let's give up everything we've just helped build. This is before Quest, so this is a company before Quest. I said, we've just spent eight years. He, on paper, had about $2 million worth of equity that he'd built up in those eight years with his other business partners. And I said, I don't care. He said he doesn't care. So he went in and he metaphorically handed over the shares and said, happiness is what comes first. And me and my wife just aren't happy anymore. We're not connecting anymore. And we thought money was the answer, but it never is. And so he's like, I'm going to go and we're going to go be creative. And if we don't cross the finish line, we don't deserve the equity. And we both agreed on that. And they turned around, they're like, well, hang on, we realize we're miserable too, so let's do something that actually brings happiness. And so they had come up with the idea of Quest. And so Tom turns around and he's like, we've got another business idea, babe. Don't worry, it's only going to be another year to 18 months. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, once we get this up and running, then we can make enough money and we can go do the film thing. 
And so I was like, all right, how do I help? Because I had at that point really had convinced myself that that was now my life that my life was going to be supporting my husband, supporting his... And and part of me probably, looking back now, I don't think I actually believe we were ever going to make film again. I think it was... Yeah, I think it was more just like, all right, I'm here to support. I feel good about it. I've managed to um, tell myself that being a support system is satisfying, which looking back now, it isn't. But emotionally, I think we all need to self-soothe. And I think we do that in ways that probably aren't a long-term solution. So right. in that short term, you self tell yourself why you're doing it. But when you think about it, actually it became detrimental to me. Were there times that you broke down? Because um, you can be strong, strong, yeah. strong, strong, strong. And then there's times where you're like, oh. It was just before yeah. Tom Handy over basically went into quit. Because I said, I don't know who you are anymore. I was like, you've lost all joy in your life you're so focused on business i'm not happy in my life literally revolves around what you do every day what time you come home right. and the two puppies so i'm not happy we're now not even serving our bigger mission that we had agreed we were going to serve you're freaking miserable right. and that's when i said like enough's enough like we have to address this we have to make a change mm. because the path we're going down i never want to be that person that either looks at my relationship or looks at my life and say how did i end up here yeah and so many people do and I i've did even that for been there years, right? yeah yeah. And it's like, it's not going to stop unless you take action, Right. period. Right. Like, you can wish all you want. And I realized that as for those eight years, I was wishing that eventually Tom would make enough money that we could chase our dreams. And I realized I had to take action. I had to stop just being a passenger, right? Not to be cheesy, but I really did. Yeah. I had to stop being a passenger on in my own life yeah. and freaking take the steering wheel and say to Tom, enough's enough, we have to change. And that led to Quest. And so Quest ended up being, babe, how can I help you? And so they were looking at, let's sell our last business to get out to build Quest. Well, babe, you're the only one that doesn't have a job. Do you mind just shipping bars from the living room floor? Do you mind? saying that, do you? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, do you mind weighing the peanut butter? So we would rent a rental kitchen. I would rent, uh, I would measure ingredients at my house. His business partner's wives would measure ingredients at their, their wow. house. And once a week, we would go and make protein bars in a rental kitchen. And we had the cutting knives, we had the rolling pins, and I had convinced myself I was just helping the husband. Our house was on the line. Hmm. Um, That's what I was going to yeah. ask you because I had heard that your house is on the line. And here you are building this company that you have no idea right. that years later it was going to be a billion dollar company. <laughs> right. Not multi-million, billion. Yeah. I mean, that's that's money I can't even wrap my head around. <laughs> I, I'm incredible. But when you have the house on the line and you're really putting everything in, how do you control the anxiety, the fear that goes there's a lot on the line yeah. here. This might not make it. You might be living on the streets. Mm-hmm. How are you going to pay rent? How are you going to pay for food? How, like all the things that start firing. Yeah. And I ask you even from personal, right? Because we are all in with Chase and Glory. And so all these things yeah. start going, huh, huh, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. And they don't stop. They don't stop. And, uh, and I could say, oh, it's fine. It's fine. You just keep believing. Keep believing. You yeah. know, but when you don't now, you get to look back, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't know what this end is going to be for me. I have no idea. So So it's scary. It is very scary. And so when Tom came home and he said, all right, babe, we've decided we're actually going to sell this company that we tried to build and we're going to put all our finances and everything we know into a protein bar company. So A, I'm just like, what do we know about bloody protein bars? And it's like, well, if we divide and conquer, we know marketing. One of his business partners is a nutrition-like fanatic. And so we're like, let's figure it out, right? The naivety of the beginner. And he said, but... I need you to know, if it doesn't succeed, we lose the house because we've just cut our pay in half. Every penny we saved up, get, we're putting into it, yeah. which means that if we lose it, we don't have any money to pay our mortgage. And <laughs> so, big size. so I, I processed through and I said, okay, what's the worst that can happen, right? I lose the house. That's going to be shitty. Can I live with that? Yes. What can I not live with? I cannot live with actually sleeping on the streets. Yeah. Right? Like, I draw the line. Yeah. I don't mind losing my house. I don't mind downgrading. I don't mind going back to a 700 square foot apartment, which was our first apartment. Like, I don't mind doing that. Right. I do mind actually sleeping on the street. Right. Okay. Is that a real fear? No. Mm. Right? Even with you. Mm -hmm. Girl, 
You right. freaking hit me up. You come and stay at mine, right? <laughs> like, but that's the truth. Yeah, you know, yeah. deep down, you're never actually going to end up on the streets. Yeah, so when true. I said the the thing that I'm not willing to do won't happen. Right. The other thing I'm the most fearful and I won't do is not being able to feed myself. Yeah. I know deep down that's not going to happen. happen. Yeah. Right. Even the homeless get food. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's yeah. actually true. But I didn't even go that far. Right. I just went. I have friends. I have family. Right. So the truth is, I'm never actually going to be sleeping on the streets. And that's a real fear for people. So they yes. have to acknowledge, is that true for them? Right. For me, it wasn't. And I said, okay, these two things that I fear the most are not going to happen. I don't want to lose my house. Okay. But that's, that's just materialistic. I can get another house. Yeah. I can build myself back up. I can learn from my mistakes. But what I can never get back, and this was really strong for me, I can never get back saying no to my husband and having him on his deathbed wishing things, wishing that he had tried something and I was the person that stopped him. Yeah. When I first met him, you remember how I said on that first date he was really him? Yeah. I knew who I was marrying. I knew he was ambitious. I knew that he has his eyes set very high. I knew that he was never going to let materialistic things get in his way of his dreams. Mm -hmm. And so if I knew that about him, if that's part of why I fell in love with him, who am I to be in like, okay, I love you, I marry you, but now you have to change. Mm -hmm. It's asking him to change. And so many people do that in and, marriages. And they do. And if yeah. you do that with your eyes open, or I should say, go into it with your eyes open. Because you can make that decision. But know that you are A, saying something to him, right? To me, if I was said no to Tom, I'm saying, I don't think you can do it. That yeah. speaks very loudly. Very loudly. Yeah. It also says that, Again, the person I fell in love with, the ambitious man, the person that has these big dreams that we were dreaming together, I'm the one changing the conversation, mm -hmm. not him. Mm -hmm. He made it very clear who he was when I married him. Yeah. And now I'm the one saying, oh, wait, 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 hang on a minute. No, no, no. All that that I fell in love with, actually now I'm changing it and I'm telling you that a house is more important than that. Oh, oh, snap. True. So I was like, I, that's just not the type of a wife I want to be. Yeah. And it's very possible he's going to fail. And that's the one thing I want to say. We tried other businesses and they failed. failed. Yeah. But Quest was put the house on the line fail. And that was the first time we elevated it to yeah. that much. We lost a lot of money in other trials. We did a website domain company. We did a website design company. And we did all sorts of things. But Quest was the first thing. But again, going back to you just got to try. Mm-hmm. And I don't ever want him to feel like I'm not supportive because he that. could fail. It, I would never like hold it against him. I would never hold it over his head. I'd be like, yeah, that's the man I met. I married. Yeah. Okay. So the fact is, though, once you get the money, right, and you make it, and so you, it was what three, five years. Which one? So yeah. So we actually. So I went from hey, just help your husband ship bars from the living room floor to realizing, wow, I actually like what I do. I can learn what I do, and. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So for me personally, mm -hmm. the first two years, I went from shipping bars on my living room floor, and in two years we grew at 57,000% for three years in a row that I ended up building out our fulfillment center. I had 40 employees underneath me, and we were shipping out $80 million of inventory. Jeez. Coming from somebody who my, uh, my, my daily job was putting clothes out for my husband and caring wow. for my puppies. Wow. And in those two years, I had to take a hard look at myself and see what I actually was capable of. I had to take a hard look at myself and see how my ego was getting in the way because I would be like, well, I don't know how to do that. Or like, but it wasn't me. But when you own your own business, there's no one else to blame. Yeah. So when you say it wasn't me, how does that help me? Does right. it help my business? No. Mm -hmm. So I had to face myself, look myself very hard and say look at my inadequacies and just tell myself you're not good at it yet and that framing changed the my yet. the yet mm. changed my framing made me realize I could learn it made me realize I could develop a team made me realize that I could learn forklift driving and inventory and regulations yeah. and shipping and you know uh, international shipping and I had no clue what I was doing right I don't know what to do google it I don't know what to do. Phone someone up and ask them there. You know, I didn't know how to do shipping. So I would call up our UPS advisor or our representative. And I'm like, hey, what, what's this? How do you do this? Owning that you don't know 
-hmm. And not feeling like that is a reflection of who you are was a massive turning point for me. And so we were able to grow from all of us just looking hard at ourselves and going, what are we not good at? Um, And so we became from zero to a billion dollar company within five years. Um, in the first three years, we were, we were announced as the second fastest growing company in North America. Yeah. Um, and it comes down to like, when you've got that much pressure, you have two options, fold or keep going. Yeah. Like, And both of you just have that in you though. You have that keep going drive yeah. for sure. Did you get that from your parents? No, initially it was purely fear. It was pure, fear. yeah, like I didn't want to lose my house. Okay. So literally we started this company. So isn't Tom that says cool? we could lose the house. Yeah. He asks me to help out. So one, I pride myself on being um, a very good wife. So, you know, I had spent eight years priding myself on that. So my husband asked me to do something. I want to freaking come through for him. So part of it is like, you can't let your husband down. You can't Mm -hmm. let your husband down. Second thing was, I don't want to lose my house. So those two things started me on my path. So isn't, I think that's a good lesson right there in to make the stakes so high. Yeah, because because every time you hit a roadblock, what do you do? find out I mean it's the to. same thing even when I even started the show I mean I was a one woman show yes. I was from editing to booking to doing the interviews to then doing the marketing do the social media posts like I was 24 7 now my husband saw me and and how much did <laughs> you have to learn everything I just literally and some of it thank god I learned in film school because I mm-hmm. went to film school I don't even know yeah, if you know yeah, that yeah, or not. Yeah. but I was totally into film producing directing and stuff like that so it was cool that I got to apply that and do this mm-hmm. but I got to I had to learn so much more than that in social media and marketing and doing the videograms and you know um but it what wore me after time is you can't do this alone right. you have to have a team yeah and it's trying to figure out though when you grow your team right to what would be I think for you the the lesson that you can give people because there's people out there that are definitely a one man or one woman Mm -hmm. show and then they have certain people that they can bring in but some of them are like I know I need more help but I can't afford more help yeah so what do you do in that situation yeah um so we had built quest to be as big as it was and then we had decided well what's the point in having so much success if you're not actually living the life that you really want to live and we were impacting people on the body but we weren't impacting people on the mind Mm. and tom and i's mission was to actually create impact and we couldn't ignore the fact that we weren't addressing the mind and so we were like all right we're saying we really want to create impact and we're definitely helping people. A lot of people are losing weight and helping like their life, you know, really changing. But there's someone like my mum who's gaining more and more weight and is getting more and more unhealthy. Why? Because every time you say to her, like I was trying to throw money at it, right? Like, mum, yeah. here's Chris bars and here's a private chef and here's... But she wasn't losing weight. She was getting worse. And when I looked and would ask her, it's because she kept saying, I can't. I can't. I'm too old. Diets don't work for me. It's all freaking mindset. It is. And so... We said, what, and I'd built, at this point, I'd gone from developing our shipping department to then developing our studio. So we were doing commercials. So the first two years I was in the shipping and then I realized I wanted to go back to my roots. I built out our studio department. We were doing commercials. I mean, it was what on paper seemed like my dream job. I'd built a studio. I had producers and cameras. We rented out a school to do a commercial. I mean, it was like big productions. And I wasn't happy and satisfied. Mm. And so going to what is really our purpose and what really was bringing joy and happiness, it was addressing the mind. It was talking. It was going deep on mindset and realizing that everything that I had achieved, everything my husband had achieved had been because we had changed our mindset. I don't think I'm um, especially special. I don't think that I was put in like, you know, the special class at school, um, you know, once a week. So yeah. it's not like I was born in te- like specifically intelligent. I just think I'm able to pick myself up when I fall. I think that I'm, I have adapted my mindset to believe I can do anything. Even if I can't, I've, yeah. I've pushed myself to believe that I could be the best musician in the world if I set my mind to it. Right. Because when I really said, hmm, if I gave up everything, everything, and all I did was practice the piano, 10 hours a day for the next 20 years, do I not think I could probably get good? Yeah, absolutely. Could. So really everything becomes a choice of where you put your time and if I believe I can actually do it. Mm-hmm. And so that mindset we realize we really believe in and if we want to create impact, we have to address it. So 
and I'm going to bring back for yeah. to your answer your question. So we went from we had very successful, very financially successful. I'd built out a studio, and now we're about to start Impact Theory. So we basically walked walked away, and um, we still had equity and everything in there, but we just walked away from the company, and we're like, we want to address the mind. My background's film. Let's really let's come full circle. Let's actually start doing content. So we start doing content, and I don't know how to freaking work an audio machine. Like I, I had hired people when right. we, when I started. When I was at film school, that was 10 years ago. Things yeah. have changed. Yes. I start Quest. When I started our studio, we had the finances enough to for me to hire people to come in and do it. So here I am, extremely su- successful with Quest. Now I'm, it's me, Tom, four other people, and we want to build an entire studio. And I'm your sound person, and I'm your camera operator. I don't freaking know what I'm doing. Right. And now I'm back at square one. Right. This is only three and a half years ago. Right, wow. <clears throat> so what do I do? I figure it out. Because I had taught myself. I had confirmed the habit loop in my mind that I can teach myself anything. And it started from a fake place. But it just I have just proven it almost enough yeah. to be confident enough to tell myself, you can figure it out, Lisa. You can figure it out. Because Lillian Garcia didn't use the freaking audio to stop her from doing Chasing Glory. You figured it out. Right. Right. Right? Like, you, you figured it. You were telling me about how you guys designed this set. Yeah. You ordered, you know, things from Amazon and you cut things up and it, oh my God, here you go. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's what, yeah. you just figure it yeah. out. If you think you can, you can. If you think you, you can't, can't, you can't. can't. Period. I love that. Because that's the same thing even with WWE when I got hired, right? And they put me on the right. set. Very first day on the job. You're going to be the ring announcer. What? <laughs> what? But you didn't back but down. Figured it out. No. Uh, panic, panic. Like it was like fear, everything, but it's still pushing through. So I want to encourage people to, to push through. 100%. But what, going back to my question, what if you know you need help, but you oh, can't so yeah. afford it at that moment? Right. I would have a plan. So I would say, what has to be true in order for me to be able to afford to get more people? So let's say it's your podcast. I know, okay, if I get more than 10,000 downloads, I can start monetizing, okay? So my goal number one is I have to get my podcast to be up to 10,000 downloads. Once I start monetizing, I can start figuring out how much monetization do I need to get to before I hire one person, right? What is the role you wanna hire for? How much is that gonna cost you? What level of experience are you looking for? Usually for me, when it's a startup and we're small, I hire people that are scrappy and like me. Mm, so really yeah see I, that's so wild to me because like robin sharma talks about hiring picassos you know it's important if to you hire can picasso. afford it hire a picasso, picasso. if you yeah. can't get someone that's hungry yeah okay right so yeah. it's like it all depends on what part of the evolution you are in your business right so for us when we first started impact theory i hired people that want wanted to improve their own self um their own skill sets because now they're there for their own reasons and someone that's not willing to try something out for you. So usually if it's content, if I was you, I would go to a school, someone that's just graduated. Mm -hmm. They're thirsty to get a job. They're thirsty to learn anything. They're going to be bringing their new experience because technology is changing all the time. So the chances are they know something about technology you don't and get someone that just wants to grind it. Yeah. But for me, now with Impact Theory, we've been around for around three and a half years and we're in that next stage of the evolution where I only want Picassos. But the people that came in from the ground are still there. They've built their reputation. They've Mm. found their niche in the company and now they're going strong on that. But they were there to help build it. And that those types of people, sometimes money can't pay for. Yeah. Oh, no. Because their heart is in it. Right. So for you, if you want to hire, I would go back to what pay do I want to do? Let's say $60,000. Okay, I need $60,000 to hire someone because that's the rate of the level of person I'm looking for. Okay, so what has to be true in order to be able to afford $60,000? If you, you have to monetize your show, you have to, is it merchandise? Is it through your podcast? Is it through your YouTube channel? Whatever method you figure out, right. you have to get to 60. So I just could then go backwards and then go, okay, well, in order for my podcast to get to 10,000 downloads, what do I have to do? Is it a celebrity? 
that I need in order to help me grow my platform? Mm. Is it that I need to start doing better marketing and I need to spend more attention over here? Like I just break things down and it allows me to really have that bird's eye view and or just say, I'm going to gamble. I've got $60,000 in savings and man, I'm going to give myself a year and I'm going to hope that that person ends up paying off. Yeah, right. Sometimes you have to. And sometimes you have to, to, yeah. Wow. Okay. So I have two really important things that I want to ask you. And one of them definitely, I have to talk about this, this next project that you guys want to do. But before I do, actually, I do want to talk about this and I'll end it with the other. This project, like you guys said, okay, Quest, great, but you just sold it. So we actually, yeah, we officially sold it um, a couple of months ago. Do you feel good about it? I love it. Yeah, it's, yeah, because I'm emotionally emotionally detached from it because I am i wasn't there every day, it's like onwards and upwards. Like my thing is my past is never going to be bigger than my future ever and it gives me such a good thing to focus on so if question sold for a billion dollars you better freaking believe the next thing i'm going to do is going to be a two billion dollar company now the chances of that being true are so slim right the chances but i have to believe it yeah that's the thing shoot for the moon i have to believe it yeah shoot for the moon okay so you guys though are talking about building now something that's bigger than disney world yeah tell me about the comic books tell me about why this is important. Tell me why um, you guys love comic books so much. I mean, I loved as a kid. This is why I wore this shirt. Oh my God, girl, come on. (laughs) Like, like I saw this in Barcelona and I knew I was going to be planning to interview you and I went, oh, I have to wear this when I interview. And the first thing I hugged you and I was like, wait a second. I love this shirt. (laughs) Um, Because this is in me too, as far as I used to read comic books as a kid and Archie and, you know, Veronica and Betty and all but now you guys are doing more, something more futuristic, like, and, and then your paintings yeah. and your drawings, like, it's blowing <laughs> my mind how good you are as an Aww, artist. Thank you, girl. Um, so tell me, talk to me about this. Okay, so let me give you then a bit of backstory to give context. Yes. So Quest specifically was, we were all working out and we had to kind of make things at home because protein bars on the market at the time were either full of sugar and happened to have protein in it or tasted like utter cardboard right and so when we look at like my husband was looking at his sister who is extremely overweight and he was like how do i help her like how do you actually help because the population maybe one percent of the population if you say to them hey you want to know how to lose weight eat chicken and broccoli and work out six to seven days a week some people are going to do it yeah but maybe one percent right so when you look at the world on getting healthy Mm -hmm. how do you actually do that on a global scale you can only tell a certain amount of people to eat chicken and broccoli. Why? Because it goes against the innate nature of who we are. We love sweet things. And so in order to try and change someone's behavior is going against the grain. Like that's an uphill battle. Instead of trying to change someone's behavior, why don't you leverage Mm -hmm. someone's behavior? Okay, how do you leverage someone's behavior? We know people love food and we know people love sweet food. Mm -hmm. So what if we created a protein bar that is sweet, tastes amazing, and just happens to be good for you. Yeah. Now people are gonna gravitate to it whether they want to or not. You know, no one's gravitating towards chicken and broccoli, but people may gravitate towards something sweet. Right. And so we use that as a marketing tool and it freaking worked. And so when we looked at the content side of things, we love, we do, you know, the talk show that you are on my show, Women yeah. of Impact and Tom's show, Impact Theory. Um, we recognize that is the chicken and broccoli for the mind. Ah. It is a 1% of people who are going to sit down and watch an hour show of talk deep about emotional stuff. Right. Because, again, it's, it's not innately in most people, mm-hmm. but what is entertainment entertainment you don't have to persuade people to watch a tv show you don't have to persuade people to watch a movie you don't have to persuade people to read a book some people you actually do but you know what i mean like (laughs) it's it's entertaining right and so when we said well what's the mindset version of the quest bar it's some like what are the things people are going to naturally gravitate to and it just so happens to be mindset empowering okay and so it's tv and movies my husband and i both have the film background like we were talking about and so we said okay well that is great, but I don't want to spend a hundred million dollars on a movie. If it tanks, I'm broke. Mm. So like, 
that doesn't make sense from a business standpoint. Right. So what is a what can we put our money towards and develop that is something that we believe in, something that is empowering, something that is innate in humans that are going to be entertaining, but um, can um, afford, a, let's say, a 9 out of 10 mortality rate? Because the chances are 9 out of 10 are going to fail. Mm-hmm. 99 out of 100 may fail. That's a reality. Right. And so what is a mortality rate that I can bear and allows me to get creative and allows me to explore in order to get to that one that's gonna smash. And so my husband, who's a freaking marketing genius, he was like, it's comic books. We both love, our first dog was named Batman. Ah, <laughs> really? Yeah, oh, that's cool. like, and that was like 18 years ago, right? Wow. So our first dog was named Batman. When I first met him, he identified with Batman so much because superheroes, you're not, um, Batman specifically, you're not given powers. Yeah. You basically use your knowledge to be better and do better and obviously he has the financial means but everything is within him yeah. he has to learn how to do it nothing's given to him yeah and so that mindset was very powerful for both of us so we realized wow comic books are a great way to put some of our finances behind but if it flops it flops it doesn't break our bank and it gives us a piece of intellectual property that we can own and we can go out to TV and movie um, studios and potentially sell to them, potentially do partnerships with them. And so it really goes back to what is our goal? TV, movies, and how do we get there? All right, let's backtrack. We can't afford to make a movie. What about a comic book? And then we just did the small little trickle effect and worked our way backwards. And our first one was recognizing that right now we have no credibility in that space whatsoever. Everyone knows us as the protein people and the impact theory theory theory. people. What are you guys doing with movies and television? So we worked our way backwards. How do we get attention for this new endeavor that we're doing? Again, my husband's just a marketing genius. He's like, you need a name attached. He happened to have had Steve Aoki on our show. They're both massive fans of um, near-term future. They're like um, future optimists. They don't think that the world is about to like go to shit. Um, they really think that new technology is going to help the world, not destroy it. Oh, good. And so they bond over that. And so Tom was like, well, what if we pitched an idea to Steve Aoki we're both very creative we'll hire the team and so he went and pitched the idea and Steve Aoki freaking loved it and Steve Aoki had a storyline that he's always wanted to do so we collaborated Ah. and um, and that's really that's where we came out with um, Neon Future so that was our first graphic novel and if you read it you it's all mindset but it's all underlying mindset ah that's brilliant I can't wait to read it now that I know the backstory that's amazing okay And And now I'm developing my female graphic novel. So that's like the next step in the evolution. And uh, is this her? So no, but my husband, actually, if you're watching this on YouTube video, this is the one where my husband sent the artist a photo of me in the gym and then sent a photo of my head and was basically like, make the character my wife. Wow. So this was like, of all things, it's pretty damn romantic that he did that. That is. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> badass. So, I but love this it. is actually part of this series. Okay. Um, so, what's the then? What's the um, when you guys say bigger than Disney World? What do you mean by that? So, or Disney? Biz, yeah, biz, bigger than Disney. And again, look, we like to dream big because I think right. that if you think that you're going to hit the roof, then you're going to hit the roof. If you think you're going to hit the stars, you hit the stars, yeah. right? Your limitations are those you put upon right. yourself. And so, for us, it's like, all right, if we want to build a studio, who's the best at building a studio? Disney. Mm -hmm. And so A, you look at them and go, all right, they've done it well. They're our competition. Um, Healthy competition, but competition. Um, And then you go, okay, Disney did a really good job of telling one kind of story. The mouse. Well, Well, like for kids. It's kids, yeah, yeah. It's magical. Magical, yeah. So you know, if I say to you, hey, I'm going to go watch a Disney movie, you know it's, you can take your kids, feel good, or it, you know, has the upbeat thing. So you know exactly the story I'm going to watch, and Disney have that those rules. They literally have like, okay, it has to have this, it has to have this, it has to have this. It's like the Hallmark Channel at Christmas. Yeah. They can't have anyone with Alzheimer's. Like I just found this whole thing out about like their rules and regulations. Um, but anyway, so Disney tells one kind of story. They tell they tell it very well, and they do it for all ages. They have kids and they affect adults. Yeah. 
And so we're like, okay, well, we want to tell one kind of story. If Disney is the most magical place on earth, we want Impact Theory to be the most empowering place on earth. Mm. And so we just have that angle and we're like, and it takes, it took Disney 50, 60, 70 years to build it. So, all right, I'm playing the long game. I've got a 50 year plan. I'm 40, it means I have to live to 100 at least. Yeah. So now I'm looking at my health and how do I optimize my health to live long enough so that I can build a company oh, wow. that's as big as Disney. But like, that's kind of how we think. And look, of course, there's so many, like the chances of us succeeding is so small, but you better believe I'm gunning for that small yeah, percent. Yeah, you gotta try. And so that's really where, what we're doing, where we're going. We're use, then using these comic books and IP. We're in talks with studios. We're you know really building out our creative team. We're bid- building out artists and writers. Um, and we're also now about to start a youth-focused comic book. Um, because there's a um, book, which I don't know if I told you about, A Billion Wicked Thoughts. No. I told you about this book. No. So a book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts, and it basically follows, when you ask people questions and questionnaires, most people stretch the truth, they, you know, like, oh my God, who's going to read this? But Google search engine doesn't lie. And so what they did is they took Google, and they took all the um, search terms when it comes to pornography. And they took all the search terms and they started putting people in buckets. And for instance, here's a weird fact, the, the most searched term for straight women is gay men porn. What? I had no idea, but it's true. Straight women like to see Watch gay men porn. gay porn, gay men porn specifically, which I had no idea. Now, no. Wow. that piece of information is so interesting to understand the psychology of women. Right. Of straight women. Right. Now, so once you start dissecting, and they started to dissect the psychology and how people, like, why is that true? Right. And why do people like this and that? Everything, the whole, I'm going to just, like, spoiler alert, the whole premise of the book ends up being, it all happens of the age of imprint, between 11 and 15. Mm-hmm. That's what everything comes down to. All the weird sexual things that people right. like, that everyone loves, that people search for. It all comes to things that happen during the age of imprint. Now, if we know that to be true, then that's when we should be targeting. Because if yes. we really want to create yes. impact, I want to help adults for sure. Right. But if I really want to, you have to be target right. the young age. Right. And so we took our business model and realized, realized our business model is flawed. The neon future is for adults oh. and so we're like all right it's fantastic we're going to keep going because it's very successful and people is getting amazing traction but the no bs thing on how you actually actually create global impact is you you have yeah. to start with the kids as well yeah so we've um switched our business model we're now um directing comics more to young kids to really see if that works we've released one comic book thus far and we've already had just an incredible influx of parents sending in photos one kid wanted to dress up as one of the characters for oh, halloween that was awesome. huge one of the kids um started just copying and drawing the comic book so it's like we're having attraction on kids already on one issue that we haven't had on anything else. And so addressing our method, our strategy, our, you know, approach, it's like you have to be nimble. You have to see, you know, all the Mm -hmm. angles and, you know, what is working. And as long as it's fitting within our mission, which is to create global impact, then we will adjust and change. So our passion is definitely the comic books, but it's just phase one of the bigger picture of creating animation and manga i mean i know you said okay, like yes. the japanese i mean so we have a huge japanese audience yeah yeah they know how to do comic books right they don't talk down to kids you look at their manga um you walk into a manga store yeah you get 70 year old women you get 14 year old boys there's no like oh that's not for you like there's no none of that right. and then in the stories alone it's kind of how pixar have done it you go to a movie as an adult, watch a Pixar movie, you can love it. You go to Pixar movie as yeah. a kid, you love it. Manga does that. They mm. don't talk down to kids. It's still rather adult. They have, you know, adult language and they have adult, um, you know, topics that they talk about. But it's just enough that kids can still grasp it, but it's not adult enough that it's, it's not right for kids. Yeah. And so the Japanese just have it down. And so to ignore that 
would be silly as a business person, let alone just someone who actually wants to create impact. Right. And so I look at the manga market and we've been looking at the manga market and we're like, how do we adjust our storytelling methods so that it's really creating impact? Yeah. And so right now we're really looking into that industry. Wow. You're having fun, aren't you? Oh, I'm having so much fun. Like I can see it. You're dude, you know, it's it's wild because we all talk about do your passion. Do your passion, work your passion and you'll have a lot of fun. Some people are stuck. They don't know what their passion is. Mm -hmm. But I love that you've tapped into things that you liked as a kid and then right. create that. Now, drawing, that's yeah. something that you've always done? Yeah, so draw, I only do it for me. I actually won't do it for the comic book. And everyone keeps asking me, you can draw for the female book? And I'm like, no. I was like, why? And I was like, A, you just take me too long. And B, there is a fine line between what do you enjoy that is for you and what do you enjoy that you actually want to monetize? Mm -hmm. I don't want people to tell me what to draw. I don't want people to tell me when to draw. It's such a passion that if I don't do it for three weeks, it's because I've chosen not to. But mm -hmm. if I do it, it's because I want to. Not because, oh my God, my business is on the line. You know, yeah. and I do so much. So even with when you're saying like you're having fun, I really am having fun. But there's a massive part of what that I'm not talking about. It's, I'm, you know, the president of Impact Theory and we have 25 employees every single day that come to our house. We put out one, two, three pieces of hour long content each a week. Mm -hmm. um, and so building a business, dealing with individuals, dealing with, um, you know, like camaraderie and, you know, team building is yeah. so freaking hard. Yeah. And making sure that you're hitting your metrics, like the, from the business side of it, right. that in November and December, that's all I did. And I catch myself in these cycles. I catch myself not having fun because I'm just too deep into the business mm -hmm. side of it and I need to be creative. And I always tell myself, Lisa, you are the one in control. So anyone that's listening right now, whether they're doing something that they don't enjoy, you have to remind yourself you're in control. And people are like, okay, well, how am I gonna pay my bills, right? right? That's a real thing and I never wanna dismiss that. But the truth is you can downsize, right? Yeah. Well, because I can hear people right now going, yeah, but you have a billion dollars. Now I, well, I wish I had a billion dollars. Right. Business it's, doesn't work it's like that. Work. So I know, people think you have yeah, a billion, yeah, yeah. right. So we sold the company for a billion dollars. Right. We have business partners, we had investors. Yeah. So, but look, I'm not gonna, yes, right. I am very, very comfortable now. But I, and I thank you for bringing this up. There's one quote that I love. Um, it's from Lisa Nichols. And it goes something like, um, actually, no, so sorry. The quote that I love is from, um, I'm not even sure who is it, who it says it, but it's um, don't look at my middle and compare it to your beginning. So don't yeah. look at where I am now and say, well, it's okay for her because she's sold a billion dollar company. That doesn't serve you, right? right? Anyone at home watching or listening, it doesn't serve you to think or compare yourself if you're just getting started to where I have been, that I've been doing for 10 years. Right. It doesn't serve you. Right. So. If you want to compare, cool, do it. But look at me where I was where you are now. Right. At the beginning, I was a bumbling mess. I can literally, all I could do was tell my dog to sit. I could barely, you know, so like the yeah. first employee I had, I was a mess. So it doesn't serve you to say, well, it's Compare, okay for yeah. her, right? right? It doesn't bring you what you need. Um, and then also it is, um, you know, don't look at me and think I'm extraordinary to let yourself off the hook. That's mm -hmm. the Lisa Nichols quote that I love. Oh, I love that. But now that you do have money, is it also something that money does buy you happiness and money did fulfill you and money, like everyone's chasing money. Yeah. They yeah. are. And let's not right. sugarcoat it. Yes. One way or another, we're all chasing money. Why? Because money does buy you things yes. that you want or this and that. Right. I'm going to give you the real no BS answer. I love it's it. It's fucking awesome. Okay. Like, gee, like, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to BS. Like, being able to not have to worry about money. Because I was, before we started Quest, I want to emphasize, I was collecting coupons. Oh, Okay. Okay, was, so you were, yeah, yeah I you was, were there. I was collecting coupons. I was counting every penny. I was making sure that we could pay our bills. So being in this position now, it's fucking awesome to not have to worry about it. For sure. It's awesome to be able to go into a shop and buy a design, designer shoes. I'm not going to BS. But it doesn't define you. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. If you're not actually happy as a person, 
all of that doesn't make any difference. How many billionaires have to actually commit suicide before we actually realize it's true? Yes, I absolutely. I, I, I've said that before that the top people that commit suicide, people don't even know and realize are the millionaires and billionaires. And a lot of it is because they thought money was going to make them happy. But if psychologically they are not happy with what they're doing or with themselves, or they've handled things that happened to them early, early on, whether it's being molested or something, and they haven't like really computed that and dealt with that, money is not going to cover that up at all. At all. And I, I totally understand, because when I was on the other side of it, I thought for sure, our oh, money's gonna solve everything. Like, oh my God, all these worries that I have, money's gonna solve. But it actually doesn't, unless you're happy by on your own. Because the truth is, it doesn't matter what bed you're in, right? Whether you're in a sleeping bag or a tempur bed. Yeah. When the lights go out and you're all alone and it's dark, what is that voice in the head telling you? Is it telling you that you're a good person? Is it a negative voice? Money can't change that shit. Right. No amount of money can change that. So I kind of liken money to superpowers. Do you choose to use it for good? Do you choose to use it for evil? Mm -hmm. It's a choice. Yeah. And so even with your mindset, do you choose to be the victim or do you choose to be the hero of your own life? It's a choice. Right. Even if you have every reason why you should be the victim, that's actually the tricky thing. Everyone who says, oh my God, like, and I know you've had just incredible stories and your story girl is just mind blowing. You've <laughs> had people on the show yeah. that have had true heartache yeah. and they have every right to say, I'm a victim. Every freaking every right. right. Yeah. But does it serve you? Right. They've does turned, it help yeah. you? Yeah, that's why it was so great to get people that have made it, right? Even mm, with you and mm -hmm. sharing your story because then people can go, oh, okay, well, she was bullied or she was you know, made fun of. She, she could have stayed a victim. She could have been like, I don't know how to do this. And you know, the Greek society wants me to just be a housewife. Mm -hmm. And you could have had so many excuses as to why not succeed. Yeah. And you said no. And you even went to your dad. You're like, dad, I want to go to film school. And yeah. here's a <laughs> Greek man. I was like, oh, okay. You know? Yeah, he's like, well, what do you need a degree in a way? You're just going to be a housewife. Right. So you surpassed all yeah. of that and showed. And that's what a lot of my guests have done. And that's why I love having these stories because it helps me too, right? I think no matter what, not, I, I feel like no matter where you are in your life, <clears throat> you're battling something. hundred percent. But you're still, you're, you're many hoonies, as I say. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're, they're sitting here with the doubts yeah. and the negativity and the this. And, you know, you even told me there were two things that as we're wrapping, I could talk to you forever, you know that. <laughs> but as we wrap this up, but <clears throat> there were two things that you said to me. I have to deal with my husband who works a lot mm -hmm. and having to find the balance, right, for you guys as, as a husband and wife. And then you even said, when we did get together for dinner, you're like, same thing with me, right? It's like, we gotta find time to be a friend. Mm -hmm. To be a friend where it's not just all work or not just all our husbands. Like having that time to, it's not about just having the dinner for the mm -hmm. impact theory. It's like, okay, I'm going to go out to dinner with a friend and yeah. be a friend. And I, I loved how genuine you were when you said, I don't think any, everybody could look at me and say I was a great uh, businesswoman, I was a great wife, but I don't know if they could say that I was a great friend. Yeah. That was so profound mm. and so beautiful that you even admitted that and said that. And I even looked at myself and I said, hmm, I wonder if I could say myself that I was also a great friend. But I think too is because I protected my environment of being with females like long distance, mm -hmm. you know? where I could be like, well, I was a good friend over the phone, you know, but I think it's important to say, look, we're busy, 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 but where does that get us in the end too? Yeah, and I think it does come down to that because when I look back, I wouldn't have changed it. That's the thing. Yeah, It's like I wasn't a good friend and that was actually a choice I made. It was like, I don't, I don't think I can be the best at my business, right. be the best wife and be the best friend and best daughter. Like I just, I, I, that's too much pressure to put on myself. Mm -hmm. Now there are choices I could do 
20% energy here, 30% energy here. I could do that too. Everything, you know, you know me, everything's a choice. Right. And so I chose, no, I'm going to go all freaking in. And I told my family, I told all my friends, basically, like, this is my life. And if you don't like it, then I love you. I get it. Like, right. that's not the friendship you need or that's the friendship that right. you want. I totally respect that. I just can't give this right now. And so I, I made the decision and... In hindsight, kind of one thing that you had said about like the success that, as you know, my health has, you know, three, four years ago now, I'm at the height of Quest, literally the most successful nutrition company in like the country, and I can't barely eat anything. Now I had a massive right. health battle that I'm still battling with four years later. Yeah. Um, and so knowing that, um, so success can't solve my health. Right. Yeah. And so then I started to say, OK, my lifestyle before has affected me to get here now. If I really because everything's in my control, if I really want to change, I have to change my lifestyle. I have to change the way I approach things and I have to choose to do that. And I had chosen to not be a good friend. And I did that with my eyes open. And now, though, I'm reflecting and saying, I don't want that to still be true. Mm. Oh, and now yeah. I'm making a choice and a decision to put friends, to make time for them, knowing very well that it could be time I could be growing my business, but it doesn't serve me anymore. And I go always say that, right? Like how many times have I said this? It just doesn't serve me to be all in in my business anymore. I don't want that anymore. I want to be healthy. I want to have joy. I've I've put in that time and that grind and it's just not what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to acknowledge that, to be open about it and be like, dude, I know I've been a shitty friend, but I'm going to change. And what are the things that you need from me? What is the language I can use? Are you the sort of person that needs me to text you more often? Like, what is your language so I can start to show you? I love that. What is your language? Never thought of asking a friend that. Yeah. That's great. Because we ask our spouses or our partners, but we don't actually ask our friends. Um, and one of my friends was like, look, I don't need you to text me and call me all the time. I just need you. I just need to know that if I do text you and I say, hey, I need you, that you're going to be there. Mm. And in a freaking heart. That's what most people need. Yeah. They just need to know that they have, you know, somebody there to catch them during the down times. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I think everyone earns a reputation in one way or another. Yeah. So when someone turns to you and they say, hey, I need you. What reputation are you building? Yeah. Are you building reputation with like, well, she said she was going to be here for me, but she's not. Or are you going to be like, wow, man, let me tell you, I never hear from Lisa. But when I texted her that I needed her, she left a shoot because I said I needed her. Right. Like, that's the sort of friend you can expect me to be. That's strong. Um, but being open and honest with each other about it is going to be very important. I also think it's important not to force something, right? Yes. Like, we didn't force, we, we went out to dinner and it was so yeah. amazing that it turned into a five-hour dinner, yeah. and it, which was incredible. Before we were like, wait, why know, did we yeah. do this, right? But it was so enjoyable. And then I go, that was the kind of core friendship and relationship that I want is to be with people that also enrich me, that I can mm-hmm. have that kind of relationship, not to go, okay, I better have some friendship. So let me just bring this girl out of the blue and just go out. And it could be so awkward. And then, and it's like, oh, yeah. I'd rather have been in my pajamas at home. Yeah. But at least you tried though, right? Yeah. And that's actually another thing that, going back to the, even the dinners and well, you yeah. coming, it's like, you've got to try. And so people at home, when you said some people, you know, don't know what their passion is, to be honest, you can't freaking find it. It's not like it's going to be under a rug. It's you literally it's like, think of the, are you as a kid, what do you do? As a kid, you try things. You try PE, you try soccer, you try different sports, you try math, you try art, and you start to find an interest in that. Yeah. Once you've found that interest, you start to go, maybe I'll do this more. Maybe I'm getting good at it. Do I want to do this as a profession? And that's how we are as kids. But for adults, we just expect us to either know something, be amazing at it, or know what we want to do in life. And the truth is, you don't know. Go out, explore, try going out with a friend, try meditating, try going bowling, try going to a concert, right? Try math, go to a school and a cooking class. You're never going to know unless you try it and go, this is actually kind of fun. Yeah, like, true. That's to me how you find a purpose and a passion. Mm, drop the mic, girl. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, I got to ask you this as the final question because I always love to find out people's answer. Like here you were as a kid looking at your life because we all do. We're like, mm, goals, whatever. 
Has your chase for glory looked the way you thought it was going to look? Not in the slightest. <laughs> <laughs> Not even remotely. Yeah, because you thought it was just filmmaker. Yeah. So the path I've taken is bizarre. But let me tell you, I'm still standing for that Academy Award. Yeah. I'm not done until I get married. Really? Yeah, so that's why also I think part of my growth and Tom's growth is we weren't, okay, we want this much money in our bank. To me, it was, haven't I won an Academy Award yet? Yes or no? It's like, okay, well, all this money is great, but I haven't gotten to my dream. Yeah. And so it's just going, what is your dream? Because that way you're not actually attaching yourself to things because the money could go away, right? right. There's a million reasons how and why. Right. But, no one can take the dream away from me. Right. So the money can go. What if you don't obtain that dream? Because my money, I mean, my money, my my goal has always been like singing. And, yep. and for me, it had to look a certain way, right? And I even wanted a Grammy and all this kind of stuff. But then I go, what if I'm setting myself up where I go for it, mm-hmm. but then I don't quite get it because it's just not destined, no matter how much mm-hmm. I've tried. No, I, so depending on the person, but my answer is I'm going to die trying. Like, that's my answer. I don't necessarily advise that for everybody because some people may not enjoy the process. And actually, that's a big key, is that you've got to enjoy the process because the outcome's never guaranteed. I can't tell you if I'm actually going to win an Academy Award, but I love what I do. So every single day, I'm fighting for it. If I hated what I did, I would give up. I hit a roadblock, I'm going to stop. Um, And so at that point, I'd be like, oh, well, maybe it wasn't for me, and here I am, and I'm going to change direction. But it's like, I love what I do every, not every day, that's actually total rubbish. I don't love what I do every day, but I I film um, my weeks with elements of things that I love and everything is in service of that element. So if I'm doing something business, like I was doing contracts yesterday, I freaking hate contracts, but it was a contract for my graphic novel. Oh yeah. And so like, even though I hate contracts, it's in a service of something I love. So I tell myself, you know, just get through this and then you'll be able to be creative. But you have to love what you do pretty much every day because there's no guarantee. So if you love singing and every day, whether you win whatever award is that yeah. thing for you, right. you know, whether it's an award or an accolade or something or just like I want to do an album, you know, whatever that is. If you love singing every day and you're working towards that, life is good. Life is good, yeah. But if you're, yeah. like I was saying in Hollywood, right? If I, in my path to get to an Academy Award, if I was every day letting people step on me, and treat me like dirt, or I would have to do the same for somebody else. It's not fun, Mm -hmm. and I would have just given up, right? I was ready to, because Mm -hmm. I'm just not willing to do that. So for me, in my career, in my goals, it's like I am going to die freaking trying. The day before I take, the day day I take my last breath, I hope I still have the mentality, right? And in fact, when I say I hope, it's all in my control, so I actually take that back. I will have that same mentality or drive for something. Yeah. Whether it's this, and I, I might change direction because right. I may not enjoy this. It's like for you with the show, it's like right now, how much is it serving I you? I love it. But in two or three years, if you freaking hate it, the advice I'm going to give you let is freaking stop doing <laughs> yeah, it, woman. Let it go. No matter how successful. Right. And right. I, I don't want to name names, but I've heard of a lot of celebrities that keep renewing contracts on certain shows because of the fame and because of their money. And I've heard they freaking hate it. And I'm just like, why? No money's worth that shit. No, no. We're only here for such a limited amount of time. Mm-hmm. We gotta just really just live it up. Yeah. Live it up. Thank you. Oh, You're such a doll. Girl. I appreciate it. Tell people how to find you on social media. Yes, yeah, so follow me at Lisa Bilyeu, but B I L Y E U on Instagram. Um, and then follow my show, Women of Impact. You can see Lillian on the yeah. show and Eve Torres. Yes. Um, so go check it out. Yeah, at Women of Impact um, on Instagram, but on YouTube specifically. And if you're a podcast fan, we are on all platforms. That's awesome. Go check it out. Yeah, you guys have got to see this because she's really got a great show. And just uh, thank you again for having me as your guest. Of course. And for you being on. Uh, Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you guys subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video 
or live stream. And definitely share this with a friend. All right, follow the show at Chasing Glory on Instagram, at Lillian Garcia on Instagram and Twitter, and Lillian Garcia official fan page on Facebook. For everything Chasing Glory, just go to ChasingGlory.com. Until next week, go out there and live with much peace, love, and passion. And remember, always be yourself and trust that it's enough. See you guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us here on Chasing Glory from executive producer Lillian Garcia. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends. And be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Hey. 